much. This morning, we have assembled a panel to discuss using foresight to improve decision making. And I won't introduce uh, all the speakers. You have their bios in your materials. Uh, I will be introducing Leon later, uh, but uh, I, think, I think we should begin. I have asked each of the panelists to speak for uh, 10 minutes, so don't be surprised if you see me handing a um, sheet of paper down the, the line. Uh, it's nothing um, unusual. It's just a little note that says, you've got three more minutes, wrap it up. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that uh, the panel members represent a, an interesting group of thinkers in this area. And I'm really pleased that we have them all with us this morning. So what I'd like to do is start with Leon Firth, and um, and then we're going to just go right down the line. Leon. Hello. <laughs> is, is that better? Thank you. All right. I now have the I now have the traditional academic problem for middle age and beyond, and that is I can see you, but I can't see in as my notes. So uh, therefore, uh, what I'm about to say is, shall we say, a cappella? Uh, just me, no accompaniment. Um, What is it um, <clears throat> that we mean by anticipatory, and why do we need it now? Uh, and how is it a response to complexity, which I think really is an accurate description, description of the way things are organized in the world that we live in? Um, when one speaks of governance, I think the idea of anticipation or anticipatory governance simply means um, the capacity to experiment in the mind uh, rather than to take an idea right to the street you or wanna, to the battlefield. You may want to just talk into this. It might be better. Let's try it. Yeah. Okay, turn that one off. Yeah. And I'll just scooch over here. All right, do I have to back up and start all over again? No. <laughs> Thank you. As I was saying, um, it's the capacity to experiment in the mind with alternative courses of action uh, rather than do what unfortunately we have a tendency to do and that is to take a policy straight to the street or worse uh, straight to the battlefield uh, and learn that way how much it's going to cost us in treasure time opportunity and worst of all uh, human life and suffering we really do need the capacity um, to examine alternative futures and the consequences of alternative courses of action. My students um, ask me uh, in the course that I've been teaching on this general subject, you know, how do you know that anybody will ever listen to you? Will a president ever be interested in this? And my response has been, if you don't organize uh, to create this capability and you do suddenly become lucky enough to have a president who is responsive to it, um, that is not the time to begin uh, to get the capability together. Start when you can. Hope that you get a presidency that does learn how to ask the right questions uh, and does ask you uh, to be responsible for the unasked questions as well and take it from there. To anticipate does not mean to have a fixed vision. Foresight is different um, than visionary um, uh, politics. Visionary politics is associated with a single view of what is going to happen and a single view of how it should be brought about. Foresight, on the other hand, um, 
is interested in what is going to happen, but it views all futures as conditional. Um, and it accepts that the law of unintended consequences is the universal and unfixable human condition. It therefore takes a more modest approach to what can be done um, than most political leaders do, uh, at least before they're in office, um, and seeks to understand the variability of the future, uh, and, but deals with it in a systematic way so that all others can participate and all others can test the clarity of the, of the reasoning. Now I want to talk just briefly about um, the, s the reason why uh, the need for anticipatory governance is becoming more intense. And then I think I'll fill my time. Um, I come from a life uh, concerned with uh, national security. Uh, but for most of the time that I was in government, um, national security was essentially a synonym for national defense. Uh, national defense is a clear enough and concrete enough um, uh, object. It is the physical defense of the United States, its assets, its people, its allies, and its future. National against, against threat of violence. National security, on the other hand, is and needs to become a much broader, more embracing um, uh, concept, as Sheila has been saying. And what I want to do is to make more concrete for you why that is so. Um, to most practitioners of <coughs> national security as national defense, it is heretical uh, to say that the subject must include, let's say, the economic strength of the United States. The response to such an assertion is that broadens the subject beyond our control. We can't manage it. Um, it, it cannot be defined. It cannot be handled. I, you know, I disagree. Um, I think history is full of nations that died armed to the teeth and bankrupt. Uh, and we are heading in that direction, wouldn't you say? Um, and so uh, economics, the economic future of the United States and everything that's required um, to promote that is a part of national security, especially from the point of view of the president, who seems to be the neglected party in all discussions of where and how national security policy should be, should be made. Now, what exactly um, is happening that intensifies this point? Well, if you look at um, what has happened as the result of the economic collapse we've experienced, um, what you see is a series of moves that most people regard as temporary and reversible. I don't think so. And so if you look, let's say, at the ability of government to influence executive pay, at the financial reform bill and its consequences, at EPA's regulatory power over entire industries, including perhaps um, much of the, in, of the industry that uses our energy, um, over government influence in the banking and investment field, over cyberspace, over the health care bill, et cetera. What you find is that uh, government, f often for emergency reasons, has been injected very deeply into the future of the national economy. Now the question is, what are the institutional and organizational consequences of that, and has anybody asked? And the answer is, I don't think anybody is, is thinking um, that the government's role has expanded beyond the capacity of the existing system. Right. Three more minutes, as much as that. <laughs> My problem is how to fill the time, not how to You don't have to, to take it. all the time. It's okay. okay. Um, I think that uh, we need a, an approach to governance that, first of all, uses foresight to help us claw back time for response, reflection, and reaction. I mean, one of our big problems is that as a democracy, um, we debate what we think is happening and we debate what we think should be done about it, and then after you think we've made a decision, we relitigate re re that politically. We need as much time as we can um, to think about what may happen uh, in order to give us a shot at influencing um, the way things roll out for the best um, uh, uh, interests of the country. And foresight is the only way to, um, uh, to, to claw that time back from advancing facts. And we need an organizational system that is able to take advantage of such time as we have. The military has pioneered, I think, in this. Um, it may think its job is incomplete, but it is so far further along than is the civilian sector of governance. 
Um, and the direction it's taking um, is a flattened networks, which actually imitates where much of the best of American business has already gone as well. So the legacy systems of governance that we have are in fact adapted to the pace uh, and thinking of the 19th and early 20th century industrialized um, America. We need uh, to go along with a foresight mechanism, a, an approach that uh, depends heavily on networked approaches to government organization, both policy formation and also execution and administration. The other thing we need that we don't have is a feedback system uh, to gauge where things actually go as the result of the impulses that we give them when we make decisions. Um, if you put these three things together, that equals what I would call anticipatory governance. Uh, it's a system to look rigorously at what may happen and what our actions may do um, to those systems. It is a system um, based on networking to speed our ability to move information and to make responses and a system to gather experience and learn what we either did right or did wrong in order to apply it more rapidly uh, to what we are in the process of attempting to do. And above all, we need what we don't have and what we're talking about today, and that is the capacity to look deeper um, into the future. Um, and for that, we need a dedicated system which has that as its function, and that system uh, needs to be operating um, within the aura of the presidency. Thanks, Leon. Moana? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Moana Erickson. I'm at the Millennium Project, and I'm, I'm here this morning on the panel on behalf of uh, Jerry Glenn, who is out of town and is the executive director of the Millennium Project. Um, just briefly by way of introduction, the Millennium Project is a global futures research think tank of futurist scholars, business uh, planners, policy makers, um, et cetera, who um, uh, have come together um, in local and global uh, perspectives via regional nodes. And there are 35 um, nodes around the globe um, that the Millennium Project is connected to and um, uh, interacts with in a very highly participatory way. So I'll jump right into the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's comprised of two components. Uh, the first is looking at connecting the dots between futures research and decision making. Uh, number one there, the integration of su success stories in a checklist for making futures research more effective in decision making. Um, and I'll go through that checklist in just a minute. It was uh, pulled primarily from a Millennium Project study, uh, which was completed for the Army Environmental Policy Institute. Uh, and the second component of the PowerPoint is collective intelligence as a new tool of foresight being applied um, at the Prime Minister's Office of Kuwait and at the Global Climate uh, Change Situation Room in South Korea. So part one, connecting uh, futures research to decision making. This is really um, a compilation of um, an A-plus checklist, so to speak. Next slide, please. Um, an A-plus checklist of um, the Millennium Project's sort of best practices, as it were, on um, how to connect fu futures research to decision-making and decision-makers. Um, I will go, if you could please just um, click down to the first 13. Yeah, it's the first page. Um, I'll just highlight, I'll quickly run through it, really, and highlight a couple. Um, one, make sure leaders know what futures research is and is not. Number two, include decision makers in the process, connect to strategic planning, uh, include workshops and training for decision makers, include interest groups and actors. Uh, if goals are lacking, include it as an issue, determine who has the responsibility to act, balance long-term and short-term views, use at least one formal method that all understand, provide information that demonstrates a crisis, include knowledge about what is possible, make options clear, demonstrate feasibility of recommendations, include subjective descriptions of alternative futures. Um, next slide, please. And just, uh, yeah, down to 26. Um, connecting costs to benefits, suggested ways of making decisions in uncertainty, uh, including intended actions of others, developing indicators, using the testimony of eminent scientists, um, looking at how projects uh, affect action or non-action in scenarios, uh, show technical feasibility to overcome fear of failure, um, the integrated use of computer models, uh, linking uh, those models to similar activities, avoiding information overload, 
uh, allowing time for individuals to integrate concepts, including media, and making work integrative and cumulative. Um, hopefully this PowerPoint will be made available to all of you, but this is really, uh, this checklist, even though I've, I've gone through it quickly for um, purposes of, of time, um, you know, it, it really represents uh, the Millennium Project's um, uh, sort of uh, the go-to checklist, as it were, um, for really how to, how to connect to decision makers um, and sort of best practices learned from all around the globe from our 35 nodes. Next slide, please. This is the um, second, compo second component of their PowerPoint, which is on um, the applications of collective intelligence as used, currently being developed and used uh, by, by the Millennium Project. Um, number one is the Global Climate Change Situation Room uh, in South Korea, where uh, Jerry Glenn, the Executive Director, currently is today. Uh, second is the Early Warning System uh, we're developing for the Prime Minister's Office in, of Kuwait. And the third is a work we're doing um, through our State of the Future report, 15 Global Challenges at the University of Science Malaysia. Next slide. So here's the working definition of collective intelligence. Uh, it is an emergent property. It's not static. As an emergent property, there must be continual feedback. Um, it is an emergent property from synergies among three components data information knowledge, software hardware, experts and others with insight that continually learns from feedback in a synergistic way to produce just-in-time knowledge for better decisions than each of these three components uh, would acting alone. Next slide. Here is the diagram that illustrates the previous slide. Um, as you can see, each can change the other. It's not static, it's dynamic, it's synergistic. Um, experts. This, this particular definition of collective intelligence, um, groups of experts are feeding from and into data information and knowledge, which is feeding into and changing the hardware software platform, which is feeding into and responding to feedback from the group of experts. Each can change the other. Next slide, please. Uh, this, um, uh, this is a, a snapshot of the global, uh, global climate change situation room in uh, South Korea. Um, this is a, a practical application of, how, of collective intelligence uh, at work to support the situation room. There are four elements, uh, climate science, energy, mitigation, and adaptation. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows the main user interface uh, for the global climate change situation room, which is a portal uh, to all the software tools and information of the, collect, of the collection intelligence site. It includes all external systems, experts that I referred to earlier, and databases that have agreed to connect. This portal uh, is based on the Drupal platform, a software platform. Um, this platform has storage, tagging, annotation, and search capabilities. Uh, this portal also acts as a beginning place Okay, for users to gather and organize data and to subsequently conduct initial analysis that is then further reviewed by Situation Room staff who will enter their analysis into a Wikipedia-like system. Um, there's an aggregator feature you'll see at the top. It'll have, it has a uh, home, et cetera, aggregator resources, et cetera. Aggregator feature constantly searches the web for relevant content as programmed by topics and modified by more specific keywords. It has over 200 RSS feeds and, and is exhaustive. Staff can also use an additional piece of software called bookmarklets to collect information from the internet and use it and enter it into the global climate change situation room. So this is, this is the live portal. This is, this is the practical, you know, real-time application of collective intelligence uh, that the Millennium Project has applied in South Korea. Um, next slide. This is a, an overview of a user interface for policy advisors and decision makers. Um, this is the kind of information that collective intelligence can produce for decision makers. On the left-hand column, you have the current situation. On the far right column, you have the desired situation. In the middle, you have um, the policies that would address the gap from current to desired situation. Next slide. This uh, slide shows a collective intelligence system that we're currently enacting for the Prime Minister's Office in Kuwait. Um, I think I won't go into detail, but you can see the top line, press releases, Google alerts, expert groups, conference seminars, key persons. It's all scanning into analysis and synthesis. Collective intelligence system is feeding back in. Um, you can see the arrows feedback and new requirements. Um, it's working synergistically. It's live. The, 
you know, this is sort of the future of how collective intelligence system and technology will interface. Next slide. This is, uh, I just have two more slides. This is a um, um, sort of a microcosm slide of the next slide I'm going to show you. This shows um, sort of the software platforms. You have real-time Delphi, which collects and synthesizes expert um, opinions through an online questionnaire. The results of the questionnaires are then fed into the local private federation server. Mm -hmm. You have Drupal there on the far right, social portal Drupal, which is a software platform that allows an individual or a community of users to manage and organize content. Um, on an online website, you have MediaWiki. I won't, you're all aware with Wikipedia, so you know that um, wiki websites allow users to collaboratively create and edit into a website using a web browser. It's all feed, knowledge harvesters, everything is feeding into a local private federation server, which then will have a synergistic relationship with a global federation server. Um, next slide, please. That, that's showing the software platform. So here's the ultimate goal of, of, of how we get to a global federation server. We have the collective intelligence system I described in South Korea with the Global Climate Change Situation Room, uh, the work we're doing in Malaysia, et cetera, the work in the UK, you'll see how real-time Delphi, Drupal software platform, Wiki, et cetera, all feeds into local federation servers. Each of these collective intelligence systems then feeds into a larger global, global federation server. Again, the idea is this is live, this is real time, we're using software, we're using hardware, we're drawing upon experts, we're drawing upon information data. Um, uh, and knowledge to, to really um, produce real-time uh, results and collective intelligence. Last slide, please. This is the report that came out last, uh, last month. It's the Millennium Project's uh, 2010 State of the Future. This is our, our, uh, our flagship uh, publication. Those are the chapters in it, the 15 Global Challenges, State of the Future Index, Collective Intelligence, which I've just gone through briefly today, Environmental Security, Latin America 2030, Other Futures Research. It has a 7,000-page CD in the back of the of the publication. Um, it's in its 14th year of publication. And the last slide is our contact information. If you're learning, would like to learn more in, in much greater detail about the Millennium Project and the work we're doing to advance collective intelligence systems through the use of technology, uh, we have two websites, www.stateofthefuture.org and www.mpmillenniumprojectcollab.org. We also have a presence on Second Life. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Moana. Clem? Um, hi, I'm Clem Beasold, the chairman and um, founder with Alvin Toffler and, and Jim Dater of the Institute for Alternative Futures. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you know about the House Foresight provision? Great. I get to tell some of you uh, uh, something new. But um, first, I want to say congratulations to PNSR for the work that you've gone through to say how things should work. As Leon said, it's really important to have foresight mechanisms and have them designed and ready to be in place when someone wants to use them. Uh, and I think that's significant. And in particular for Sheila, as, as we've heard, in terms of the leadership for this, the question of, of what do you do with this design of this organization, putting it uh, in the White House. Um, the, um, the significance and some of the questions that have been raised are relevant to the House Foresight Provision. The House Foresight Provision sprung from an effort of the Bowling Committee House reforms in the 1970s. Then Congressman John Culver was on the committee. Uh, Congressman Sarbanes, then Congressman Sarbanes, ran that effort. There were a few members who were committed enough to the way the process worked, the institution of Congress worked, to, to go through this reform effort. Um, the significance of and they had two parts to the reforms that came out in the 70s. One was reorganizing the stovepipes of the committees. And the other, thinking about how Congress works, administrative and operational activities. The reform committee, the, the committee structure was shot down in the 70s. The administrative reforms were accepted. One provision of those reforms was an overhaul of the oversight section of the House rules. The next slide. And so that, that 15 Congresses ago, there was included in the oversight section a requirement that House committees, other than appropriations, do futures research and forecasting. And I'll walk you through what that is. That came again from John Culver's insistence that Congress not be surprised, that Congress, the congressional committees, understand what's going on. So ne next slide. Um, that's the House rule. I'll give it to you in detail. It's in the, it's in the House rule, rules. And what you should know is what happens 
no one cares enough about the House rules to make any changes. So they are accepted ver verbatim at the beginning of each Congress, with minor exceptions if, like we created an Energy Committee or the Homeland Security Committee, just minor changes. So this rule has been there since then. Uh, next slide. So in effect, the section that deals with um, oversight, um, that's Rule 10, Section 2B, um, basically says that Congress, congressional committees, need to consider whether uh, programs should be continued curtailed or, or eliminated. And it exempts the Appropriations Committee because in their appropriations hearings, they have a somewhat different task. It's similar, but they ask, in effect, about the functioning of programs. So next slide. So in that context of oversight, they also say that a committee should look at any conditions or circumstances that may indicate the necessity or desirability of enacting new or additional legislation addressing subjects within the jurisdiction of the committee, whether or not a bill or resolution has been introduced with respect thereto. So they are the subject matter domains, or the subject matter keepers of what's in the jurisdiction of the committee. Uh, and future research and forecast uh, uh, within its jurisdiction. So they should know what's going on. Uh, the, um, and so the next slide. And it's interesting you know, that, that that has sat there. It turns out I'm a political scientist. I did my dissertation on foresight in Congress. One of my three case studies was this provision. So, so I'd, I was around at the time it was being considered, um, but nobody knows about it. And uh, Walter Olasek, a senior person at the Congressional Research Service, who testified to the PNSR process, raised this and basically said that, you know, repeated what I've just said, but saying that, that you know, little is known about how congressional committees apply, House committees reply with the requirement, uh, and because they no doubt do it in multiple formal and informal ways, and I'll say more about that in a minute, and in particular about the ways that the security and defense community could do more to reinforce foresight um, on, the, on the Hill. The, uh, the next slide. And, and then the rationale, which was part of the original history um, that Olasek raised, and it parallels the concern for the, P, the, the, the PS, PNSR conversation about bringing foresight to the, to the White House, uh, is that basically, understandably, lawmakers and committees focus on major issues of the moment. In a complex world, however, it's important that for Congress to be sensitive to long-term threats, challenges, and changes so it's not caught unprepared. And, and so that, you know, that's a classic issue. The question is, what do you do about it? And, uh, and I should make the observation that I, I think there was probably more foresight and more consistent foresight in the 70s than now on the Hill, in large part because of the polarization in Congress. Uh, and it's in part of the challenge, one of the questions earlier was what's the issue about politics? And there is a cultural phenomenon that drives out foresight, that foresight's about uncertainty. Um, you can't get into the right kind of arguments if you acknowledge uncertainty. So there, there's a challenge. But the question then, and I'd argue that this community um, should consider, is how do we encourage foresight? Next slide. Um, in House committees. And so each committee and subcommittee, I'd argue, should develop an oversight and foresight agenda at the beginning of each Congress. It's mandated to develop this agenda at the beginning of the Congress. It should include a foresight component, uh, asking, you know, are there, are there or will there be changes in the factors that current policy or legislation assumes or is based on? Um, are there or will there be emerging issues that will change the nature of the problem? Um, consider developing scenarios of the future in the policy area looking out 10 or 20 years, use those scenarios in monitoring trends and update those, and determine the topics where early warning information must be developed by or for the committee. I think that's sort of a, every Congress, that should happen at the beginning of the Congress. Next slide. Um, in terms of, um, I'd also argue that for implementing this, have committee uh, members and staff and key interest groups focus on the future, include forecasts and scenarios in the committee orientation retreats and policy sessions when they get trained on what we're doing, sort of what's the policy area. Committees make requests routinely to GAO, CRS, the National Academy of Sciences, either directly or through them, CBO, include foresight questions in those assignments. Some committees do this, some House committees do this um, on a routine basis. 
Um, likewise, in dealing with agencies reviewing policy areas or specific programs, ask for forecasts for key factors. Um, potential surprises or emerging opportunities that might alter the, the current approach. And I'd argue that given the quadrennial reviews and the other sort of major policy statements within defense and security, that there is more formal opportunities for cycling foresight through the eyes of, in front of the eyes of the, the uh, defense and security commi committees. Um, also the recommendation, then the last slide. Um, basically have cross committee, multiple committee assignments for scenarios. In other words, the committee should get together with others on topics that clearly transcend their jurisdiction and cover multiple areas, and those should be multiple committee um, uh, scenarios or futures efforts. And there's a tricky one, this last one, and I'm very open to comments, and that is um, what do you do when the Republicans and the Democrats are so in disagreement? And one possibility is to create parallel and competing scenarios in terms of looking out in the future. We often argue that going out 20 years lets people, sort of gets beyond the, uh, the politics and arguments of the moment, um, and that is often the case. But uh, another option is to say recognizing that, that they won't go anywhere, have, have them develop, um, uh, have both minority and majority uh, develop scenarios. So there's this provision out there. It shows the history of good intentions not being applied. It shows the history that no one enforces the rules on congressional committees, so, so nobody cares. Nobody even knows that they're not doing this. Um, and so there, there is a lesson in the sense of uh, that, that often happens for foresight-like adjustments. So that needs to be paid attention to as, as uh, any of the options coming out of the PNSR move forward. But there is this opportunity to enhance foresight uh, by using this, this House foresight provision. Thanks. Thanks, Clem. Okay, Eric. Good morning, all. Thank you. Uh, let me add my, my kudos to Sheila. She and I go back over 20 years and looking at these kind of efforts, and uh, we probably are going to be at it another 20 years, and I hope I'm able to be there with her when she gets there. And, and also to Jim for his efforts. Uh, I've been dealing with interagency coordination, collaboration, planning, reform since uh, before PDD 56. So in a biblical way, PDD 56, the Old Testament of PNSR, the New Testament, put them both together, and you have the guiding roadmap for the future. Uh, if, we're, if we're very lucky. I come from the National Defense University. I'm the director of the Center for Strate Applied Strategic Learning. It used to be the old National Strategic Gaming Center. That used to be the old War Gaming Center. We don't do war games anymore. Gaming trivializes. So now Center for Applied Strategic Learning. Uh, we're now obfuscating. But what we really do is, is look at the mission of teaching research and outreach for national security affairs. I just came back from Middle Tennessee and to back up one of the things that uh, Sheila said this morning about the American people need to understand and are not very well educated in these kind of things. Uh, I didn't realize there were three Tennessees. That's why there are three stars in the state flag of Tennessee. Middle Tennessee is about 1956 right now. Uh, and it was great to walk back into that area. I was taken to task in my lecture on, uh, on current national security challenges and answering the question, are we the new Rome? I was taken to task by a gentleman who was very upset that Hillary Clinton was spending all of her time overseas traveling uh, around the world when she was in fact the Secretary of State. And I said, yes, she's, she is the Secretary of State. And he said, yes, the State of America. And she needs to be in Washington. And I realized at that point that if we're dealing with that level of understanding, uh, there's not a whole lot of forecasting or forethought involved. What we do at NDU is not only use foresight in our gaming activities, and I, and I am not, I see many of my friends and colleagues out there, I'm not going to give you a, a gaming primer. What I am going to do is plant some ideas and thoughts in your head as to the challenges that we in the gaming and simulation environment use when it comes to alternate scenarios and forecasting and forethought. 
Uh, we not only are dealing with that, but we're also in the business of trying to create people who are forethinkers, the critical decision makers of the future. And as you all know, we train for certainty and we educate for uncertainty. So as we look at that from our point of view, what exactly is it that we do and how is it that we are challenged? When I began in the business of gaming, my mentor told me there are three different types of games. Uh, there are educational, there are analytical, and there are operational. And there are three levels of games, strategic, operational, and tactical. And for our purposes, if it's educational and it is strategic, then we at National Defense University will engage in that activity. And that was in 1986. And that world in those days allowed us to remain in the strategic educational environment. What was pointed out this morning and what Mona uh, showed uh, was the new complexity. And, and I understand from the world of adult learners that the average attention span of the adult learner is 13 minutes, which is uh, about five minutes into Mona's uh, pitch, you guys tuned out. So back again. What, what we realize now is that the world is as complex as she demonstrated with all of those circles. Put yourself in the position of King Arthur. All he needed was a round table, 12 knights, a lady in the lake, and a Lancelot, and he had it resolved. Our world is much more complicated. So in order to deal with the realities of our world from NDU's point of view, looking at the educational components and the wider policy community, the two groups that we support, what is it that we are trying to do? What we are trying to do and the reason that we really do support this whole idea of strategic assessment, actionable foresight, and a center with a focus along those lines is that it really would, I think, help us tremendously in preparing these future strategic leaders because one of the things that bedevils us in this gaming environment, slide that you have here, is that when you ask current, ask current leaders to look into the future, one of the regrettable things that normally happens is that they revert back to their state of most comfortable past. That's why in the gaming world, when you have people sitting around the table in tabletops, many of them begin their interactions by saying, well, when I was assistant secretary, deputy assistant, well, they've gone backwards. That's not what we really want to do. We really want to look into the future. So our challenge is to break that line that goes to the past. Next slide. And in order to do that, we use a couple of things that, that uh, have worked to our advantage. If we are, in fact, going to look into the future, there are potentials, some linear, some non. When you start at the point of departure of today and look into the actual future and project yourself along those lines, you may or may not be satisfied. Where is the center that can come together and in one very timely, I think, Concrete, some of the other words that were used this morning to describe the center that Sheila is talking about, either validate or question whether the end point of this process of thought, analysis, gaming, is where you want to be. Look at the arc. If that's not where you want to be and you really want to be at X1 or the desired future, how do you get there? What is that desired future? What are the conditions that differ from the linear future that is where you're going to end up if you just continue to do what you're doing right now, which is basically muddle along? If you then project yourself into that desired future, how do you work yourself back to the current reality? Because the sooner today you begin to get along the new line to your desired area, this is the value of gaming, because you can project resourcing, you can project time, you can project capabilities, you can pr project all of the various components that we've talked about, dime, pull AC, whatever you want to use. 
what you end up with is an ability to begin now closer to the bone so that it's cheaper, less costly, more effective, and actionable. Again, support for the actionable future center. Last slide. I go back to a good buddy of mine from the Army War College, Charles Taylor, came up with this cone of plausibilities. Can you project the future? We went through a huge debate in the late 80s, early 90s about can you, can't you, the utility, well, it isn't, no, it can't be, well, we've got technologies, we've got artificial intelligence. Well, it wasn't intelligent, and it certainly was artificial, but therefore, what, so uh, this cone of plausibilities gives us a mechanism, one of many, many mechanisms, and I just throw it out today just for, for, for thought, because along this line of if you in fact understand the forces that get you to where you are today, then where you're going to be tomorrow is not that hard to predict. And where you're going to be a little bit further into the future is actually a little bit more comfortable. Now, 2020, 2040, 2060, it starts to get a little bit vaguer out there, but not beyond the realm of possibility. So if you are analytical, and you in fact do use some of the tools that are available in the gaming medium, it's not unreasonable, as Project Horizon and some of the other Millennium Challenge Project and whatever have, have shown, it's not unreasonable to figure out what you need to do in these contrasting and alternate futures. Bottom line to all of this is do we need a center? Do we need some kind of a focal point, a center of gravity, a hub? Certainly, from an educational point of view, we feel it would be very synergistic. From an analytical point of view, it might be redundant, but if you can empower it as close as it might be to the office of the presidency, it certainly would be very, very useful. We're all in favor of it, and we would look forward very much to collaborating and cooperating with you in that regard. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Tim? Hello. I will, there we go. I will try to avoid death by PowerPoint in the audience by just hitting some of the high points in these slides. Uh, first, oh, how about this? There we go. Uh, essentially, this slide just says I agree with Sheila. Sheila, I see the words that I heard used this morning, systemic, uh, complex, and uh, next slide. The point I want to make about the question I was given, what can the greater foresight community have to offer, is that when we talk about the foresight community, I think we often talk about it in obvious terms, and it's not obvious. It's not obvious because it's evolving, and it's a much wider community. People who are functionally interested in foresight and are internally making commitments to resources in that direction should be part of the foresight community we think about when we think about a center like this one. It is a real question about how the world is becoming more complex. It's not just faster. It's not just more populated. It's not just geographically more global. But there are people out there that weren't there before. I mean, Friedman's simple mind, the relatively simple mind, the superpower individuals uh, are part of that. And what he really meant at the time, as I understand it, was people like the Taliban, et cetera. But the idea that individuals can make a difference in a global sense is in a very important issue. The idea that NGOs are really getting involved in policy and not just a voice to be heard or ignored. The idea that the global economy comes in from nowhere and makes a change in your own backyard, all very important points. And finally, the role of business in how government is administered has become completely transformed. Slide, please. There's the problem. The problem is that when you talk about how to look at this complex and systemic world, who is it that can look at it in a whole, not of government, a whole of globe context? Who has the authority to speak knowledgeably in that area? And second, 
Who has the ability to respond functionally? We're really talking about a matrix approach, and that's what I see as the response to the question about who should be involved. Um, and of course, there is a culture within at least what has traditionally been known as the security community. And you know, you can you can say, "Oh, I know that," or you can smile internally. But you know, the whole idea of hoarding or classifying information, fighting over who gets to do what. Um, certainly, who should be uh, a, a top dog would be a good term. Um, in a situation, all of those have a history that we're all familiar with. Slide. NGOs are very, very important. Private sector is very, very important. But the real question is, are those people not going to be just involved in what we call the stakeholder strategy of Im implementation? You make an analytical decision, you come up with a policy, and then you sell it. But are they going to be involved in the analytical dance from the get-go? That's, I think, the most important question. Slide. <sighs> Tools to deal with this. We've talked a little bit about it. We talked about um, new things that are coming out. We saw some examples. Um, but when you talk about chaotic, chaotic interfaces, I'm not talking about, you know, breakdown. I'm not talking about incomprehensibility. I'm talking about the basic mathematical fact that when systems that are different interface, they cause unexpected consequences, you know. Uh, 1990s thinking, but still not, not 2100 action. People still don't understand how complex systems work, and they don't know how to make them work in a way that's beneficial. Next, please. And the way to respond to that, in my mind, is that you have to have a robust, and I mean something that produces long-lasting and functional analysis, analytical system. And you have to have a system that helps leadership understand what it is that's being said. When you're working in, uh, you know, Bayesian algebraics, or if you're working in enormously complex models, you're having, at one time, the challenge of bringing people who need to know what you're talking about up to speed. That's a big challenge. It isn't an easy thing to help non-systemically trained individuals come to systemically complex and sophisticated decisions. Slide, please. The whole business of the cloud, very, very interesting. But, you know, the cloud has a flip side quality to it. It's pretty foggy in there. It's very difficult to see what goes in and go out. It is the classic black box. When you start thinking about new and sophisticated ways of crunching data, new and sophisticated ways of looking at how you can tell the leadership and your colleagues on the analytical team that don't come from the same discipline as you do, what it is that you want to accomplish and what it is that you hope uh, will be the action items that come out of your analysis, you really need to have a new set of skills. Last slide. Where are those new set of skills going to come from? I would say essentially to finish up my theme, they're going to come from a wide range of sources from the private sector. There are enormously interesting things being done in defense on gaming. But, you know, there are, like for example, in, 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 uh, as I say on this slide, uh, I was recently a witness on a, on a gaming um, program for national, a panel for National Academy of Sciences that was almost entirely based on my past experience uh, on, on a new experience for me because it was, it was private sector, 
A lot of very interesting things being done. It was being done for the Defense Department, but it was a new mix of players. And what that new mix of players, and we're really talking about HR issues which were brought up from the floor for this center. What that new mix of players needs to be able to do to, is to drill down in detail in systems and to look up in the mega sense across uh, interactive uh, complexities. What they need to have is an enormously wide range of skills and backgrounds, I'm, I don't mean just somebody who's been in analysis, but actually out in operations, and they need to be able to translate the judgments that they come to, which is, I want to use that word judgment, I agree completely about the art form part of analysis, to people who haven't had the same backgrounds as they are. Essentially, they need to speak foreign languages to leadership. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Tim. Jonathan? Thank you. Good morning. The failure of governance, economic, and social systems is easy to forecast. What people find hard is to imagine surprising success. The way in which the vision and foresight that the PNSR uh, and Vision Working Group uh, are calling for uh, means that that's how we could actually meet this challenge of helping people imagine the surprising success of our governance, economic, and social systems. And that's quite critical right now. Vision and foresight offer creativity and hope that can restore public faith in our government. If you look at the surveys, you see that's missing. You see that's been declining and eroding. So the idea that governance will sustain our dreams that America will make the 21st century even more successful than the 20th century for people around the world, around the world well, that's a critical idea. And the vision working group foresees a way in which our government can actually fulfill that promise. What would that look like? Well, our government would begin to attract in the very bright young people who would want to work for our government before they would go out to industry. We'd see the integration of our government with business and NGOs, as uh, Tim is speaking to. And that's going to be around strategy, as well as solutions for these very big problems that are emerging in the 21st century. We could see the dreamers working with the doers, the people who bring the operational and tactical intelligence, who are very, very good in the now being able to learn from the people who work as futurists who are very, very good at working decades far into the future. So it's that bringing together that we have seen occurring in islands in the government, in DOD, in State Department with Horizons. We see it certainly in the business sector where Clem and I have worked for, for decades and you can see tremendous work in simulations and scenarios. The marrying up of that highly conceptual and abstract work with the futures with the very pragmatic and tactical and operational capacity that you find in groups like local law enforcement, in the military, that's the key. And that's what I believe could be turned by the Project on National Security Reform recommendations. So if we can move this agenda forward, we will provide a governance capability that you could see coming in Kuwait. You can see it's well developed in Singapore. You can see it in the UK. And you can't see it here in the US. So the Vision Working Group has described a first step towards this vision. And I say, let's take it.
I'll buy that. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Warren? Okay, thank you, Sheila. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Warren Fishbein. I work at State INR, where I, where I coordinate the Global Futures Forum, which is a multinational partnership of uh, intelligence and security organizations uh, looking at uh, transnational uh, security challenges in, in an unclassified uh, way. Um, what I want to do in this uh, presentation is to talk a bit about foresight from the perspective of, uh, of intelligence organizations, uh, which obviously have an important role to play in developing any type of initiat government-wide initiative in anticipatory governance. Uh, foresight has been traditionally part of the, of the brief of the intelligence world uh, through uh, estimative or strategic uh, in intelligence. Um, and also things such as the, the global trends uh, study that studies that the, uh, the NIC has put out over the, over the past uh, several years. But the, the gold standard in intelligence has always been a uh, shorter term, warning, uh, alerting us to the next uh, Pearl Harbor or 9-11. And what I want to do here is make an argument that in the security environment that is developing, that looking longer term or looking more strategically is, a, is actually critical to doing shorter term warning. Uh, and that this actually also involves a major organizational changes in, in the way intelligence is done. It's not simply a question of adding some, some new tools. Now the reason for this relates to the change in the global security environment which Sheila and uh, Tim and others have already talked about, the, uh, the emergence of a, of a very complex environment of, of, of interactions among smaller actors, of obscure players and super empowered players and uh, novel technologies. And when you put these all together, it leads to greater uh, potential for nonlinear outcomes, uh, you know, black swans as, as be become popular to call them. And this has two very significant implications. One is that the scope for doing traditional intelligence analysis using evidence and logic and, and trying to build a case and, and trying to see how things can can uh, logically unfold is becoming smaller simply because the, the environment is just too complex. We don't know who the players are as we, we could in, in the Cold War when we we're looking at, at uh, major uh, state threats. And secondly, um, and, and, and correspondingly, the, the scope for foresight for doing uh, a broader thinking for horizon scanning, scenarios and gaming, that is becoming much much larger, you know, the, the, the right brain side of the brain is growing and the left side is, has a, a little less uh, to do, although both, both are continue to be very important. Uh, the second major implication is that we need to be continuously alert for major surprise because nonlinearities can prop up at any time, as, as we saw and has already been mentioned in the case of the, of the global financial crisis. Now, Again, this is not simply a question of, of bringing in tools. Uh, there are plenty of these tools out there. They're, they're used in the intelligence community. It's the need to develop a systematic approach to linking foresight with ongoing intelligence processes. Because let's face it, we, we forget. We, we do scenarios, and, and I bet after we leave an exercise, most of us have forgotten what, what some of the key findings were you know, within two days after, after doing it. We're affected by cognitive biases which make it difficult to see nonlinear uh, effects. And of course, there's just the, the tyranny of the inbox that we're, we're focused on, on answering the mail, and we just don't have the time to, to, to continuously think about, uh, uh, to draw upon uh, what we've learned to, to think about how things might suddenly change. So uh, what this requires, in my view, is that we need to move to, to a concept that's actually being developed in networks uh, centric warfare called cognitive readiness, that we need to develop processes whereby intelligence analysts are, uh, are inculcated in, in, in situational awareness, in processes from for remembering what, they, what they've uh, learned before in, in various exercises, in being intellectually adaptive. What we need is that they have a rich mental library of things that could happen that they can draw upon to see weak signals, and that's what they're going to be in a complex world of, of, possibly, of things that could possibly change, and, and, and seeing these signals uh, strengthen and become significant and something that they should alert policymakers to. Now, this is not 
necessarily an easy thing to do within the current structure of intelligence because we're focused on production, uh, we're focused on, on, again, logic and evidence. Um, we have an, a very rigid account structure where we tend to look at our individual uh, you know, countries or, or issues and we don't necessarily engage in continuing dialogues and on thinking how, how things might change, how, how things might interact. And so I, I think what we need to do is to have a uh, processes and, and individuals, uh, uh, foresight specialists who are there not, not primarily to do analysis, not to be subject matter experts, but to be experts in bringing uh, analysts together to think about alternative possibilities, to recalling what has been done in, in, in the past, and helping them to look at uh, incoming information, uh, to look how do these apply to, to what they are seeing, how could they be looked at through a different lens, what might they be telling us that if we were just doing it on our daily basis we may not be seeing. So that is what I think is, is the real challenge that we face, um, and I think we need different incentive structures. We need to, to really take some of the lessons that, uh, that organizations, uh, how am I doing on time? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that organizations such as uh, uh, what are called high reliability organizations, such as nuclear power plants and, and aircraft carriers, where they, they are continually focused on how they might be, be wrong. And there, is, there are incentives, not just to do things in the, in the, old, in the traditional way, but to really challenge uh, what's going on, uh, to collaborate very closely, to get different perspectives uh, involved. And so what I'm saying is that we need to, in order for foresight to really have an impact in intelligence organizations and in the way they feed into a broader intelligence process, we need to move away from sort of the, the academic type organizations uh, that we have uh, and, and the very uh, you know, stove-piped organizations in, in various ways to these, uh, these more um, uh, organizations that, that, that are really focused on bringing people together, on, on challenging what they, what they think that are very introspective. And it's a big challenge, but I think if what we're talking about uh, today is going to work, uh, it, cannot, it cannot be, I, the, you know, the intelligence world and, and reform in it cannot be isolated from creating a, a, a national ability to, uh, to, uh, to look ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. We have time for questions, and I'm sure you have many for the panelists. Yes. Um, biology is the new physics. Um, complex adaptive systems uh, react, they interact locally and in real time. Um, that brings into up the question of the possibility of evolving systems that enable us to make the system respond in a better way. It will respond as it responds, and the minute this center is created, the system will adapt to the fact that it exists. Um, it is therefore imperative that we're clear on what it is we're trying to accomplish. I think Sheila was, was, was excellent in defining the role of the center as an information source and an analytical source and that kind of thing. So my concern is the guy in Middle Tennessee, um, because it all starts with him. And um, I don't, I don't even know how to formulate a question in the context of this, of this discussion about that guy. Because when I talk to Leon about what we're doing, to, in his mind, if I, may, if I may represent it, we are figuring out a way to empower that guy to participate in this governance system in a way that makes it more responsive. Um, you talk about a black box. Well, a car is a black box to me. I have no clue how it works, but I'm really competent at driving it, and I, you know, so. Is there a way we can formulate our process such that we, taking all of that into consideration, that guy in Middle Tennessee becomes a more effective participant in our democracy? Uh, I'm gonna take a, a first stab. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is when you uh, respond, please give us your name and your affiliation. 
Um, I think, at least from the center's standpoint, that we have an opportunity to use technology and social media and wikis to, to get the hopes and the dreams and the wishes of the people of the United States pulled together and give them a forum. Would we need to monitor it? Yes, because obviously we have to be cautious simply because we're gonna have, you know, children reading, you know, some of this. And, and even within a, a freedom of speech, because it will be an educational process, I think we'd have to be a little, uh, a little careful about having things posted. But I do think it could give uh, a new outlet to educate people. And I mean the person in Middle Tennessee. And having lived in Oak Ridge, I understand a lot about how different I felt those people were from the people certainly who I was raised and educated with. Um, and yes, there are three Tennessees and, and they're all so different. Um, but I think it's representative of the cultural pluralism of the United States. And no, there is no one vision of the future. But there are probably 300 some odd million visions of the future and they are unique to the people of the United States. And that's exactly one of our greatest strategic strengths. And we need to find mechanisms to build on that. It doesn't change the fact that we still need to be much more prepared as a nation when we are cohesive to address the issues that are going to come our way. Can, can I take a crack, Sheila? Absolutely. Um, I, I concur with both of you. I'm not really that concerned with the guy in Middle Tennessee. Quite frankly, as a, as a teacher, you're gonna encounter that kind of, and, and this is not a pejorative ignorance. Uh, ignorance is not that bad. Stupidity is different. This is an ignorant individual, he wasn't stupid. Very successful businessman. My concern, and I'm speaking specifically about the idea of the center, is that I'm a realist. I've been in this town since 82. I've seen the way the systems work. The system of systems, the systems of systems work. If there is not a specific orientation, what you end up with is one more center of gravity that is in competition with systems and centers that already exist. And, and the concern, it goes back to, to, I think, the question about locality. Where is this located and what does it become a function of? If you take policy planning in state, that's where long-term policy is supposed to be planned. What do they do? They're the speech writers for the secretary because they're brilliant, they're close, they're easy, and they're productive. If we're not careful, this particular center becomes much the same. It becomes the center of the dirty little job office because none of the other centers that already do this are willing to give up their Bosnia or their Iraq or their Haiti or their or water or their petroleum and you end up with as Carlos Pasquale find, found and John Herbs found with this center that they start, started the, the, the stabilization and reconstruction folks uh, is that, that the traditional established centers don't give up anything and you end up being marginalized and, and that and I'm being very honest here and I will work with Sheila and, and Jim on, on trying to do this, but boy, that really scares the heck out of me. Middle Tennessee doesn't scare me. It, it's this town that scares me. Okay. Right here. Um, Patty Morrissey from ODNI Strategy. Kind of going in and out. Um, I think sort of one of the most important things that's striking me from today's discussion relates, or I'm trying to relate your work, Sheila, and your committee's work in describing the functions of this center to what I remember one of the core 
recommendations of Pinzer was, which is we have this gaping hole in the middle of our national security establishment in terms of managing across the agencies and in coordination with the intelligence community supporting that. And at DNI, that's our constant where we're wrestling with where do we plug in? We're the intelligence community, we're not the we do everything related to knowledge community. We are a critical component of helping understand the national security impl um, implications of information from various agencies and we feed that into an interagency structure that has um, a, a critical support to the president for policy both near term and long term. So I guess my question is, I've been wrestling with how this center, um, is it part of that management structure and the, the other part does more of the day to day, fills the gap of pulling day to day um, various pieces across the interagency together to respond, for example, to a emerging bio threat. Um, that's one of the things we're wrestling with. Anyway, I'll stop there. Well, I as far as the, s the center as it's currently conceived, um, remember the deep battle exercise issue. Um, and I think, the, I think we have to have a place where deep battles can be fought, so to speak. Whether the issue is economics, whether it's a large, messy issue with Iraq, or Afghanistan, whether it's uh, preparedness for a uh, major hurricane season that is approaching. And I think the issue is one where functionally it needs to be in, a, in the interagency space, so it has to be in the executive office of the president. Uh, so in fact, it can look across the spectrum of uh, the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, the State Department, agriculture, energy, all the different arenas that have to play. And it needs to have the flexibility to interface with our allies and partners abroad, non-government uh, organizations all over the world, uh, probably the private sector. A lot of different stakeholders are going to have to interface with this center so that it has a complete systems view of issues. And I don't know any other way to do that, but I do want the filters that end up going to the president to be off when it comes to this center. And that will not change when you look at the president's daily intelligence brief that goes through the filters of the intelligence community. Uh, when the Secretary of Defense speaks, it's through a filter from the Department of Defense. It's those filters that somewhere in the government, somewhere actually in the presidency, we have to remove those filters so that a president has an opportunity to do some of the learning. I think that perhaps Eisenhower was our last president who understood this in depth, possibly because he was the ally, the supreme allied commander in World War II. But I think more, just as importantly, he had the, the mind and the education and the training of, of joint professional military education, or w which is what we would call it now. And very few of our presidents come to the presidency with that perspective. This has to be at one of the primary missions, even though it may be an unstated mission, is to ensure that the president doesn't have all these other political filters sometimes. They ha he has to have an outlet for that. This would be a, a good way to do that. Yes, you need to do this. Still. As you know, there's a distinction between uh, foreign intelligence um, and domestic policy. 
and in fact there's a distinction between intelligence and policy, which I hope um, is still respected. Namely, that intelligence analysts are not supposed to make themselves uh, factors in the formulation of policy. Because the moment they do so, um, they can no longer be trusted to be searching for objective views about what is going to happen or what is underway. Uh, they have to be looked at as advocates for a particular response on the part of the United States government. Uh, and that is not their job. It's the job of those who have been elected or appointed by those who have been elected to actually make the policy. So um, when we're talking about a whole of governance response to complex global issues in which the United States is irrevocably intertwined, um, you need an entity which can absorb the output of an ODNI, which is doing foreign intelligence, uh, but capable of integrating those with all sorts of other issues um, that are going to be reciprocal drivers in what the world does. The way in which intelligence operates is it masks deliberately the interaction between American decisions and international consequences. Um, I don't believe it would be appropriate, for example, to um, send the President a report analyzing um, how the world's financial markets are going to react to his fiscal policy when it's announced. Um, and there are many other issues involving what we do and what is going to happen reciprocally elsewhere in the world where it is difficult for the intelligence community to engage because that, in fact, pushes it into the realm of telling the President what it, the intelligence community, thinks should be done. You need some organization um, that can fill that hole in the donut, and that's what we're talking about. Sorry, tempting to bridge uh, foreign and domestic, and it is very difficult, and it is related to the struggle of how do we pull that together and not overstep the bounds that you were just getting at. I, th I also think that ODNI will be one of the primary customers and users of the center. It will not only be the presidency, it will be many of the cabinet secretaries themselves who are going to say, you know, my department is about to make this recommendation to the president, but you know, maybe I ought to get some more input from my colleagues and we'll go to the center and have them do a game or an activity that will help us more effectively integrate in a coherent way what we bring to the president. I think some of this will provide more of a forum for that sort of thinking. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Robin Dorff with the Strategic Studies Institute, uh, Army War College. I'm reminded of a longstanding uh, discussion that I've uh, had, or a long-running one, and I think the issue of distinguishing between the policy and information, whether it's intelligence or not, is important here. Your comments about getting these filters away from the president, lots of those filters are chosen by the president. They happen to be part of the policy making process and I'm struck and maybe going back to Eric's comment that the way to get this organization lost in the rest of Washington and in, in government is to presume that somehow it's really going to produce this perfectly neutral an analysis that is devoid of policy implications and therefore it can stand above the policy fray, not just politics in terms of partisan politics, but the fact that presidents and their appointees are going to come in with pre-existing agendas. And I think that's a, a big piece that I haven't yet heard an answer to, that how is it going to fit in that way and not become, I think as Eric's alluding to, just another competitor for the president's time, some of which, and I think I go back to work I'm currently doing again back on Iraq, the president didn't want to hear certain things. There was certain information that could have flown and could have been acted on, but was not. So that's a comment. And then the question, back to earlier, how is this, uh, how are the people 
uh, is this a presidential appointment since it's part of the executive branch? Is there a confirmation process for anyone in this? Is it standalone? And if so, what powers does the president have to decide, Robin, you did great service for the country, you're fired. And then go look for somebody who will head the center and provide the strategic analysis and assessment that essentially the president and their national security folks want to hear. Thank you. I'm sorry, the pause is characteristic for me, I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> I'm just slower to marshal the words. The it goes back to this question about um, do you wait until the magic moment comes and you have a president who is intellectually disposed uh, to try to look at the world this way, or do you take any and every opportunity that you have to build this capability a component at a time hoping that it will be able to be used when its opportunity or opportunities come, and I vote for the latter. Um, I think the United States is in sufficiently great difficulty now, uh, in part because we have not thought well enough, and in part because others are thinking better than we are about where they want to go. So there, we don't have years to spend um, waiting to evolve a consolidated and perfected answer to these questions. Um, I really think we have an emergency of governance on our hands and need to, to find ways to proceed in bits and pieces, and I guess I'll be addressing that um, after, after, after lunch. Um, I mean, you're describing thing and things as they are are as they are. We can't reinvent the system. We have to figure out elegant ways to work with the system that we've got, uh, and in some cases, what you'd call a patch uh, to handle uh, the obstacles that it continuously throws in the way of its own survival. Okay. Myron? I'd like to direct this to Leon and Eric. Identify um, yourself. Oh, this is Myron Stokes, Global Head of Holdings. I'm trying to listen harder to my microphone, which isn't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> so could you, could you speak a little louder? Okay. Um, uh, I, I'd like to direct this to uh, you and Eric. This is an old and maybe a rare discussion that uh, might come dangerously close to the realm of mere semantics, but um, War Department versus Department of Defense. There has been some concern over the years when this uh, was discussed about, discussed for, um, uh, that a shifting of focus or even an erosion of the psychological advantage conveyed by War Department, um, psychological advantage more refined or defined, um, an implication of strategic and tactical superiority, um, you know, on, by those individuals under the designation War Department. There, I just wanted you to, that had been discussed before, the change from War Department to Department of Defense, and Sun Tzu would have a field day with that, I believe. Did you know um, that what is now called, the, well, what used to be called the old executive office building, the one that looks so strange because it's out of, the, out of the 19th century on the White House compound, that that used to be the War Department of the United States. Um, and if you walk around there, you will find holes in the marble floor because that's where the gates used to be to physically separate the different uh, departments. Um, if you look at the doorknobs, um, you will find that they carry the escutcheons of the original uh, components of the War Department. Um, it's, and if you go back further, there's a picture of Lincoln in the White House. He's standing with his other uh, members of, of cabinet around a little table. That was the cabinet. So I mean, you have um, the evolutionary ch change, the effort of the United States as a governing system to adapt to an increasingly um, complex environment. 
And so the War Department um, to the Department of Defense and the Department of Defense into its modern morphologies, this is really a response to the increasing complexity of the, of the problems that the place had to deal with. Um, where I think we are is, is at the limiting extent of, of what you can do by kludging together um, totally distinct and, com and self-mandated uh, components. Uh, I don't think you can melt the system down and recast it into something else, but I think you need a patch to help the elements of the system, to help the people who are running this system have an idea of where it is, it is going. It will take, um, and I think you can do that sooner rather than later, and we'll get into that um, after lunch. Um, it would take the Congress um, to, to bring about a deeper integration. And I guess my point to your question is, I think we've reached a point in the life of the country where a deeper integration is needed or the systems we, got, we have will not be able to manage the problems that are coming to us. So there's another stage out there beyond Department of Defense, Department of State, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. 